All right. Let's get going, guys. We're continuing this morning in the church series. We started a few weeks ago with the Lord's Supper, and then the Lord really sowed into my heart uh, how we need to discuss the whys behind what we're doing. So when we talk about church today, we're going to be talking about this local gathering, the, the, the corporate worship that we come together, and then we enjoy this time of fellowship, or very often food, uh, of preaching and praying and singing, uh, and that's going to be our church series in the, in the hope that as we continue answering that question of why, that through the Bible we can discover the reason and the design, the vision that God had in everything that we now embrace as church. And when we discover that, the, the answer to that question, why, then maybe we'll be able to position ourselves as individuals so that we can do our part in bringing about uh, God's vision here. Whatever God intends on happening, all under the umbrella of church, it still boils down to us as individuals, doesn't it? Um, so that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. We're going to be specifically honing in and focusing on singing. Uh, why do we do these different things? And we'll be studying some of them throughout the coming weeks as the Lord will lead. But let's look at the why. Let's look past the tradition. Uh, in the Lord's Supper, we discussed that maybe three weeks ago. Then after that, we talked about how worship, coming together corporately in everything that we do, how that is one of the mightiest weapons of warfare. We'll look at, again, uh, at that in a moment in 2 Chronicles. We've also talked just, uh, just this past week, we looked at after we had built on the Lord's Supper and worship being a weapon, we kind of backed up a little bit to get some of the foundation under us as to what it used to look like and bringing us forward into where we are today. Now, as we look back, one thing that we began to see unfolding was something that we're going to have to continuously keep in the front of our minds. And this is what we're going to call the overarching theme of this church series. And, and to help understand this, I began to question my seven-year-old son just yesterday. I figure if I, can, if I can get to the bottom of it with a seven-year-old, then we ought to be able to get to the bottom of it ourselves. Amen? So I asked Jude, I said, hey, man, I was, you know, I was thinking about some of the stuff we talked about last week. We, we went all the way back to creation. We talked about the Garden of Eden. We came up through the Mosaic Law, the tabernacle, the temple, to the you know, New Testament, the New Covenant, the agreement that God had. And every bit of that was for a reason. So I asked my son, I said, why do you think God created this world? And you said, so we would have a place to live. I said, yeah, okay, true that. Yeah. Why did he need to do that? Like, well, I mean, we need something to eat. You know, we need somewhere to live and stuff like that. I said, that's right. That's right, son. I said, but, but why did God create us a place to live? He said, because he wanted us as his, his children. I said, okay, we're getting there. And I said, so why did God want us as his children? He said, because God wants a big family. And that's when I knew we was turning, turning a leaf there. And I said, dude, what is, what is your favorite thing to do with your family? He said, just to spend time. I said, and that's the exact reason why God made this world. That's the exact reason why God worked through the Garden of Eden and placing man there. And that's why that even after the fall of man through the Mosaic Law, as we begin to see God unfold the tabernacle and the, all the purification processes, the ceremonies, the reason there is the same reason that we do church today, and that is because God wants to be with us. He wants to be with us. So in the Old Testament, under the, when the Israelites were brought out of the Egyptian captivity, we remember what that looked like. God traveled before them in a, in a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God was over them. And then for very specific individuals, the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood of that time, God would, if everything happened just right, God would come into that Holy of Holies and those, those men could enter into that place where they could be in the very presence of God. They could make the atonement for everyone else so that God could continue doing what? Being with his people. We watch that through the building of the temple, the setting up of God's place on earth where he could come and dwell in the midst of his people. And then Jesus came in body, God in flesh, the incarnation, God came and he actually physically walked among us as his creation, as mankind. All along the way, guys, God has been working to get back to us, to spend time with us. And now in the early church, we see as Jesus died and was buried, as he was resurrected from the grave, and as he ascended back to heaven, he has come back. And now 
finally, after all these years and all the generations and all the, the separate agreements and covenants, God dwells in us. So even as we approach this series or this, this one specific topic in this church series on singing, it is very important that we filter everything that we're receiving through that central theme. And that is that everything we do, everything we do, and all that we experience is solely because God wants to be with us. We'll pick this up in uh, Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. This is going to be Ephesians. We're going to look at chapter 3 first as Paul begins to unravel this plan. And then we'll go in a moment to chapter 5 and also in Colossians chapter 3. Those are the two scriptures that talk uh, about singing in the congregation or in the church or uh, as corporate worship. So in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3, Paul says, As I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed his mysterious plan to me. And he begins to unroll this plan. Let's skip down right here to verse 6. And the plan is this, that both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news, they share equally in the riches. Okay, so God opened it up for everybody. They, swore, they, they share riches inherited by God's children, both a part of the same body. And that body is the church. That's what we're talking about today. In verse 10, God's purpose in all of this was to use the church. God wants to use the church to display his wisdom and its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in heavenly places. And it continues in verse 11 saying this was his eternal plan. This is what God chose to do even before you and I were even born. God had a design. He had a plan. And then we can go towards the end of the chapter in verse 17. And it says, whenever all this is taking place, when God has his way in the church, it says, then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. So we see it again, the, the overarching theme, guys, repeatedly, time after time after time, is God wants to be with us. I want y'all to say that with me. God wants to be with us. No matter what you're facing in your life, God as sovereign God, having total control over everything in this earth, know this, that he is working it in such a way that he can be with you. So when we look at singing in the church, as we will here in just a few moments, there are ways that God is using this today, the ways that he designed it so that we could be with him so that we could experience his presence. So whenever I was a guy, I'm going to say it. We had some video games. They that. weren't nearly as sophisticated as some of the stuff you guys deal with today. But we had this one little game. Uh, well, one game of this game was called Top Gun. Now, this is the one where you had to get the little, the little jet just right before it would land on the aircraft carrier. I mean, well, on, a, on the landing of this thing, and we're talking about how we're going to approach this whole teaching here, but on the landing of this jet, it was very specific in what your airspeed needed to be or what the angle needed to be and your altitude. And it would tell you, it would give you indicators. Hey, guys, you're, you, know, you, need to, you need to go down some and lower your altitude, decrease your air. You need to speed up a little bit. And you could hear it, you know. But at some point, when you were committed and there was no turning around, there was no flybys, then it would, it would take the controls, it would put, kind of pan out, and you didn't know until, until you got to look at it from the side whether or not that, that jet was just going to keep going down and splash right in front of the aircraft carrier or if it was just going to not go down and splash on the other side. But I mean, for those of us that did, we knew this. The approach was very important. And, and, and you didn't get a second chance. And, and, and once you... Once you got to that point where you was close to the, car the carrier, then it's going to let you know how well you had done. Yeah, so much of that is, it, always, it resonates with me whenever I'm bringing forth this teaching and how we, ha we must embrace this as God wanting to be with us. Our whole approach to church is what determines how it works out, how it comes out. You know, I, I love showing up early on Sunday mornings. And, and one reason I love it is because there's, there's people that are showing up here and, and, and their, their sole purpose for showing up is just to put themselves in a position to serve everyone else that comes. I talked to a man just the other day, and he, he said this. He said, man, all week long, I work and work and work, and, and I go to church to get my batteries recharged. <clears throat> I didn't respond. This, this but this was, this was what kind of shook me. If everybody's approach to church was to go to a place where you can hook up and draw the energy out of it, which is what being recharged is, then sooner or later it's going to be no power. 
So I'm going to challenge you throughout this church series as we approach this, to approach it as an opportunity for not only us to experience God, but for us to have our batteries charged throughout the week. And that's God's vision for us as individuals as part of the corporate worship is that all throughout the week, we spend time with God in a way that charges us, in a way that energizes us, so that whenever the time comes, we're able to discharge. We're able to charge others. We're able to serve and to give. We're going to see this theme here in just a moment in singing. You realize that God designed singing not only for something for us, but ultimately, as you'll see in a moment here, according to the Scripture, it's something that's really for others. It's going to be a challenge for some of us. So as we go through this, some of us are going to be like, yeah, what I love to do. I see the, I see the, you know, the, the true design of it now. But others are going to be like, you're, you're telling me to do that? You're telling me that's part of God's design for me? I can't just come and just absorb. I can't just come and take it in. Well, I'm just going to let God bring that out to you. Because the very first of our points this morning is this. We are commanded to sing. We kind of worked towards this direction last week, but let's go ahead and tie some loose ends here. Let's answer the question, why? So uh, first, singing, let's look in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, 19. Paul says to the other church, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. We're commanded right there. Look also in Ephesians 3.16. Paul says, same writer, different church. Let the message about Christ and all its riches fill your lives. And then what does he tell them to do? Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Also, here's something for you guys that you need to do. If you want to be obedient, you need to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. Number one, you're commanded to sing. Preacher, why don't we sing? You're commanded to sing. Now, what if I stop right there? It'd be sort of like I remember growing up as a child, or maybe you maybe you kind of are doing some of your children like that right now. There's just sometimes you just tell them, hey, this is what you're called to do. Do it. But why? Don't ask me why. Just do it. Yeah, that's the way I kind of grew up. And then there was a point in my life where I think my mom and my dad both knew that, you know what, it's good to give them the answer to the whys. Because at some point you just, you, you maybe you just, your curiosity begins to fail or whatever. So I want to do that for you guys. I want to provide through Scripture and through the early church and the Bible here the why behind why we sing. When you sing, you allow the message, as it's talked about in these two passages, to, quote, fill your lives, richly fill. Look back at them with me for a moment here in Ephesians chapter 5. Paul says, don't be drunk with wine. Now, he's making a comparison as to the way things were in that day. In that day, this is what church would look like. Everybody in there, uh, it was actually in the pagan temples, they would get together, they would begin drinking wine, they would begin drinking alcohol. These guys would get smooth, hammered. It wasn't like a little sip till you feel good, then you can kind of, you know, kind of take, let your hair down and have a great time. No, it was getting just smooth, wasted, uh, because uh, the real service didn't start until everybody started throwing up all over the place. Archaeologists that now study these areas can still see until today, 2,000 years later, the evidence of this puking all in these pagan temples. So they had a real, real shindig, okay? That's why Paul is saying, hey, we're talking about church here. We're talking about what it's going to look like. He's talking to the early church about, if you look back at the beginning of this passage, it's how to live in the light. It's how to walk in the Spirit. And now he says, don't be filled with wine, but swing the pendulum to the other end of the spectrum and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And what happens when you're filled with the Holy Spirit? Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves. Among yourselves. We'll talk about that in a minute. Back over there in uh, Colossians chapter 3. What is it about singing? Why are we commanded to sing? Right there in Colossians 3.16. It says, let the message about Christ in all its richness fill our lives. At the very beginning of this passage, Paul is giving us an indication why it's so important. Singing is, a, is, is, is sort of a path that God uses to give you 
the blessing of the Holy Spirit to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Singing. It empowers us. If we look back at the passage we begin with in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, we see this is really the whole push of the whole thing of church. It's to put us into a position where we not only can receive, but we can be a vessel in giving to others. That power, right here verse uh Verse 19, it says, May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Whatever it is in, in any area that you're struggling today, then we must realize that to live out the life that God has called us to live, to, to see His vision brought about in our life, and our everyday life, it's going to require this power. You will never be able to walk in the light, in the newness of life, without the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. So it is a command that is given to us, but it is a command that is filled with a promise. Sing and be filled. As you sing, just as we have this morning, embrace the lyrics of some of those songs. Just let it so powerful. That in a, in, a, in a service where we're all in the midst of one another, we're singing and we're being filled by God's word through these songs. Thank you. So secondly, when you sing, you take all of this and you're physically making war. War. Maybe I should say spiritually because if you're over there fighting physically, then maybe there's an issue. But anyway, what does that look like? Look in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. At the beginning of this section, Paul goes down a list of how we are to respond if we're going to live in the light. In verse 5, he says, you need to put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. And then that just kind of sets the pace, sets the stage as to what's to follow. And if you want to look at what some of those things are, I would, I would uh, really encourage you to look through that chapter because he begins to dissect what, what life in the flesh looks like. Then he opposes that by what we're to put on life in the spirit. And what that looks like, all that proceeding where we're at in this verse 16 of singing. So when you sing, you make war. If you were here a couple of weeks ago, this will resonate with you. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, Jehoshaphat, the king, even if you weren't here and you follow along in your ancient past devotion, you studied this. This is the point where uh, God told Jehoshaphat how to do war. Remember, all these other nations were fixing to come in. They were sway outnumbered. They were being crippled by the fear. Okay? And we'll pick this up in verse 21. It says, After consulting the people, all right, the king Jehoshaphat, he appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord, praising him for his holy splendor. And this is what they sing. And after you spend some time singing some of these spiritually correct and scriptural songs, then you will begin to see that in yourself. So that one right there, when I read it, I, I was immediately taken back to a song that says, Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever. And, and, and that was just keep coming back, keep coming back. And that's what it is, God. That's what the war, that's how the uh, Lord told Jehoshaphat to enter into the war. So this is what war looked like. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. Y'all help me out. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. So here's this entire army over there, and this is what they hear. And watch what happened. It says immediately in verse 22, at the very moment they begin to sing, at the moment they begin to give God praise, the Lord calls the armies of Ammon, Moab, Mount Seir, to start fighting among themselves. It threw these guys off. They killed their self. How? No weapons, no swords, no armor, not even a foot soldier. Singing, praising God. How could such a thing happen? He told them it was going to happen. Look in verse 17. He told them in verse 17, you will not even need to fight. Take your positions and then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. There's so much happens. You know, some of you may have noticed that about halfway through the worship service and we are singing, I went to the back. 
And, and that's something that I do, and, and I'll probably continue to do that from time to time, is because here a, mo- a number of weeks ago, God done an incredible thing right here in the midst of worship. I saw it as I came into the sanctuary. This is the day that there were 18 people baptized. This is the day when I came into the sanctuary, and, I, and in the middle of the second song, I noticed people were weeping. I, I, I watch you guys, and I, I, sometimes I'm in the sound booth. I want to watch and, and see, and I'm, I'm asking God to, to speak and to, to, you know, to, to show me if there's some, a different direction that needs to go. And as I went to the back and I began to watch, I, I, this verse was resonating in my heart. There's times whenever even with just singing and praising, God just takes over. And he says, you know what? Stand still and watch. It's not by what you're going to do. It's not by your power. Watch what I'm going to do. So God took what was going to be a valley of death and destruction, and he turned that into a valley of blessing. You can see that at the end of verse 26. It said, even to this day, they still call that place the valley of blessing. Why was it such a valley of blessing? Because whenever the army, finally when God said, okay, it's done, y'all go ahead and go. When they topped the hill, all it was was dead soldiers and the plunder of war. The blessing that God had left for them that took three days for their army to haul it off. Just the riches and the blessings. How did it happen? With thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. That's how it happened. Just singing. So when you sing, you make war. It is our best weapon. Worship and what happens there and singing is one vital part of that. Thirdly, when we sing, we are spiritually strengthened. We'll read about this in Acts chapter 16. God, this is where, where Paul and Silas were actually incarcerated. They were put into prison. Look over here in Acts uh, let's see, Acts chapter 16, a familiar story. But watch what happens as the scripture unfolds and we read down through here. In, in Acts chapter 16, we'll begin in verse 25. It was about midnight. I don't know what time you guys like to start your worship service. But when these guys were locked up and in prison, and I'm not talking about some little air-conditioned, heat and cool, little cushy pad. I'm talking about down in a dungeon, you know, where, where you're chained to a wall of stone and it's cold and it's nasty and you are standing in the bathroom what do these guys do they start singing in verse 25 around midnight paul and silas were praying and singing hymns to god and the other prisoners were listening what happened as they began to sing what happened when they began to sing is the same thing that god wants to happen when we begin to sing okay he's not the god of change he does not change he does not alter he has worked mightily through the people that love him, his children, and singing in the, in 2,000 years ago, and he wants to do it today. So let's look at what happened. In verse 26, it says, Suddenly there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. I've done a survey a while ago, and I asked you, how many of you guys show up to sing? And it was probably 5%, maybe 10. What's going to happen when 100% engage in singing? Maybe it won't be a physical earthquake, but I guarantee you what will happen. Spiritually, you will begin rocking people's world. When someone comes into a sanctuary and everybody there is singing and praising God, it's going to rock their world. It's kind of like being at the, at the football game. You know, you can be at the football game, not even watching the play, but if everybody in the stand stands up and starts hollering, dude, where does your focus go? Right back where it's supposed to, doesn't it? You go, you're, you're standing up trying to find what just happened, what just, what's going on. <gasps> and and, and I might sound weird. But anyway, a lot of times, guys, that's what it kind of looks like at church. Whenever we all decide to praise God and to sing out, the earth begins to shake. People's worlds, their world starts rocking. You know, they're, they're, they're receiving so much from what's going on with everybody else. You're singing all these songs, and, and, and they know your life, and yet you're able to come and you're able to, to offer up a sacrificial offering of worship by singing. 
It says the chains fell off. All the doors were opened. This is where we find freedom spiritually. All this was a, showing us physically what it looked like so that we could understand spiritually God's vision for worship, corporate worship, and, uh, and today specifically singing. When Paul and Silas began to sing, the earth shook and everything happened. And as a result, in verse 27, the jailer woke up to see the prison doors were open. And as it was the rules of that day, if you allowed someone to escape, you had to die. So he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him. Now Paul is, is testifying to him. Paul is witnessing to him. He said, stop. Don't kill yourself. We're all still here. He showed that man in the midst of everything that God was doing that I value your life. And, and we haven't just taken an opportunity to get out of here and, and, and realizing that that's going to cost you your life. We're still here. And what happened? As the jailer called for the lights to come on in verse 29, he fell down and he trembled before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and he asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? We began this whole series talking about how if church has its way, people around us are going to be changed. And we can, we can evaluate the effects of church in our life based on that. We can look at our lives and we can look around us and, and look at our close relationships. Perhaps it could start out for many of us in our family, uh, you know, in, in our, our marriage, in our children, or our parents, our extended family, our siblings, and and so forth, and then, you know, our friends, our workplace, and school, and things like that, and we can evaluate the effect of church by how it's impacting those around us. Simply put, are people around you drawing closer to Christ because of what God is doing to you through the church? Are people getting saved? That's God's purpose, isn't it? Sure it is. The Great Commission. Jesus said, all the power, all authority, heaven and earth is given unto me. I'm giving it away. I'm giving it to you guys. I'm empowering you to do what? To go forth into all the nations, to teach, to preach, and to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I, Jesus said, I have been called to save lost souls. In Acts 1.8, we keep bringing these scriptures up because it's so vital for us to understand. Jesus says, you will receive power. What's that power for? That power so you can be my witness. Paul was being a witness that day. How did it start? About midnight, they began to sing. They began to praise God. Singing gives us the, the spiritual strength that we need. As we begin to sing, just like that little gentleman that video game, God takes the controls and he brings it where it needs to be. Fourthly, as Paul and Silas did experience that, he instructs us. He instructs us here that just like that singing in that prison wasn't just for themselves, even though it did give them strength, it wasn't just for themselves. It was for others. In Ephesians 5 and 19 and Colossians 3 and 16, you see these words, among yourselves, each other. We sing to the Lord as we come together. And when we sing to the Lord, it builds up others around us. Behind it, I read a, I read this story about a, a pastor in a, in a big church that for one worship service, he sat between the, the senior pastor and the executive pastor, which was the two, two head pastors in the ministry. He said, so before the worship began, he was thinking, man, this ought to be great. I'm right here in the middle of these guys. And, and, and man, when we start singing, it's just going to be an awesome. He said that when he was standing there, he thought he was in the middle of a couple of goats that were being slaughtered. He said the, the, the singing was horrible. He said he didn't know if, it was, if he was in a dog fight or goats being killed. No! But he said it was so inspiring. Why? Because these guys was giving it everything they had. It means a lot whenever you're giving everything you have. And, and maybe it doesn't all sound the same, but you know, God never gave us that scripture, did he? He never said, hey, it, if you can sing like that, then sing by all means. But if you can't, then it's okay. Just stand there. Make a joyful noise. Sing it to the Lord and make a joyful noise. As a matter of fact, it says make music in your heart. You got to reach down deep and you got to dig deep and get that. 
I mean, we'll do it for other things. Some of but I bet you there's some of you that really get into a game that looks quite different when you come to church. So, guys, building up others. This is this is like the main thing that we can't miss because so many times we come to church and we're, and we're sort of like that battery that's being drained and we want to recharge and we really don't want to put anything out. And, and for some of us, singing really is an act of sacrifice. It's an act that we're extending something of ourselves that's not natural. It's not something that we just really long to do. Uh, so for the majority of you guys, for you to come and to sing is going to be something that you're going to have to just really just going to have to do. Singing provides a pathway to joy. There's a few psalms here we'll look at. We can flash through those real quickly. It provides a source of joy. So for many of us, we show up for church and we stand in need of joy. Let's roll through those. Psalms chapter 5, verse 11. <clears throat> says, but let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them sing joyful praises forever. Spread your protection over them. That all who love your name will be filled with joy. And it continues, says, I will be filled with joy because of you. I will sing praises to your name, O Most High. See the connection that's made here, guys? David says, but as for me, I will sing about your power. Each morning I will sing with joy and about your unfailing love. For you have been my refuge, a place of safety when I am in distress. And lastly, in the Psalms, it says, because you are my helper, I will sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. So that's the Old Testament. What about the New Testament? What does it say in James chapter 5, verse 13? It says, are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. What happens? What happens when we sing? We're going over this. We're studying this. Whenever you're in the midst of a, of, of people that are happy and they're offering up their song and praising God, it provides a pathway to joy for us. And even whenever we aren't particularly feeling joyful, in our pursuit of joy, it is very important that we understand that our singing will provide a pathway for that joy to find us. Lastly, guys, and it brings this all together, is this. Whenever we gather for corporate worship, everything we do, from the, from the initial fellowship to the to the praying the singing and, and, and worshiping through song and music the preaching the, the lord's supper the, the water baptism everything that we do is done to glorify god ultimately that's the goal we sing to god we sing about god and when we sing to God about God, about what he's done, then everybody around us experiences that. That's our choice. Bringing out God's word through song, through preaching, through praying, helps us to put down these deep roots, helps us to build one another up. It is, as we mentioned, it's making spiritual war against the enemy. How many of you guys need some victory in your life? How many of you guys need some victory in your family, in your relationships? How many of you guys need to, to wield that sword to defeat Satan? He's come to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, I have come that you may have life. And it's important that we see that in corporate worship, every bit of that is intended to glorify God, but specifically this morning as we focus on singing, that is a pathway that God chooses and uses.